so I've termed this, this first lecture radiator transport fundamentals. Um, there's a fair bit of kind of material we're going to go through here. Um, and while the content in some sense is fairly basic, um, you know, it can open itself up to a lot of questions if you're willing to ask them. But um, so let me just give you a quick outline about what we're, we're going to discuss. So first I'm going to talk about the various models of light propagation that one can choose to adopt uh, for given situations in biomedical optics. I'm going to talk about both from a theoretical perspective what their limits are, that is what are their limits of applicability, um, both from a fundamental perspective as well as from a practical perspective. So certain models may be applicable to very complex situations, but the practicality of using them makes them really not usable. Um, so once we do that, um, then I'm going to talk about the differing uh, considerations one has when one is interested in modeling light propagation in contexts where the objective is to learn something about therapy versus uh, learning something about diagnostics. Um, and so that, that um, gives rise, there are different considerations of the light field that one has to consider. Then I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, how one needs to treat um, absorption and scattering in any sort of turbid media and how this gives rise to the radio transport equation. So in this context, we're going to be treating light as discrete particles, photons, as opposed to dealing with wave characteristics. We'll be uh, dealing with wave characteristics tomorrow uh, in full. We'll talk about them a little here. Um, then after, we'll, we'll end with the radio transport equation, and, uh, and then we'll set that aside for now. We'll return back to it on Wednesday. But then I'm going to talk this, kind of the biomedical aspects of this is, is we're going to talk about what gives rise to absorption and scattering properties of tissue and relate those properties uh, to, uh, to the physics. And once one understands the absorption and scattering properties of tissue, we'll recognize that they give rise to characteristic length and time scales, which are relevant for radiator transport and provide a context for that. And these two uh, latter considerations will inform us as to what are the salient models of light propagation one needs to use given your situation. Okay, so let's just get started. Models of light propagation. So let me just you know this is undergraduate physics, but it's always good to just remind ourselves. So you know one can treat light or view light in two different ways. You you have the kind of the classical wave description. We recognize that light is a transverse electromagnetic wave. Your direction of propagation is mutually orthogonal to both an electric field oscillation and a magnetic field oscillation. Okay. And um, you know, the full description of this in a wave consideration is given by Maxwell's equations. However, in many situations, at certain quantum limits as well as in the radio transport um, context, it's very helpful to deal with light as uh, a particle, that a neutral particle that propagates, uh, represented by localized massless quanta of energy, which we call photons. Um, the energy of a photon is directly proportional to its frequency or inversely proportional to its wavelength. Right? So shorter wavelengths of light, higher frequency of light, you have more energy. And that's important in the context of absorption properties, right? Because if you have shorter wavelengths of light, they're absorbed because you can promote um, electrons from lower ground states to higher excited states. One thing I forgot to mention is that all these lectures are on the web. So you will be able to download these. You can actually probably get on the web right now and find them. But that's one thing I neglected to mention. Um, so um, maybe let me pause one second and do that, because I think that's So as I was saying, um, this energy is relevant because at smaller wavelengths, you have higher energy, and that allows you to push electrons around. And that 
you know, your absorption properties in tissue are really um, connected to the electronic energy states of electronic orbitals. However, right, once you get into the infrared, you can no longer push electrons around. And basically, all your absorption properties are linked to vibrational modes of molecules. Okay? So it's always important to keep this in mind. Um, the other thing also to keep in mind is that we are um, just focused on this very, very narrow area of the whole electromagnetic wave spectrum. You know, uh, in lower energy, uh, I'm sorry, in lower energy, you know, you go into infrared, onto microwaves, radio waves, go to higher energy to soft X-rays, hard X-rays, gamma rays. And we know intuitively that these are very, very dangerous, right? You can, you know, drive mutations, et cetera, and because of the high energy. Um, and, you know, microwaves work by basically exciting vibrational and rotational modes and molecules that, that then uh, get dissipated as heat. The reason I put up this slide, even though it's a very basic slide, is that it's very important to really recognize the length scale of, of these, uh, of, of light relative to biological media, right? So bacteria, cells, et cetera, are about on the order of microns. Okay, so you're really interrogating biological media on a spatial scale, which is relevant to biomolecules, to, um, to cellular constituents, to cells, uh, and cellular aggregates and tissue. And so it's really this interaction between this electromagnetic oscillation on relatively similar spatial scales to the, the microscopic constituents of tissue that allows us to extract information on microscopic cell and tissue structure, as well as more macroscopic physiology. Okay, so that's always important to just kind of keep in mind. Okay, so kind of the most rigorous model of, of dealing with electromagnetic wave interactions with any medium is Maxwell's equations. And this models all wave phenomena. So waves, uh, wave interactions give rise to various effects that you've all studied back in high school and in and undergraduate. You have interference effects where you have two or multiple waves interacting with each other. Uh, you have diffraction whenever a wave tries to uh, basically uh, hits an obstacle, right? You don't see a, a solid boundary. You see um, a bit of diffraction. You have various orientations of this electromagnetic wave, which is represented by polarization. And, and these equations, which we'll see in more detail tomorrow, or essentially, the, the results of these uh, of, of, of uh, Maxwell's equations gives you results that are accurate on all spatial scales. Okay, so this is kind of the gold standard way of dealing with with the interaction of light with media. However, it it is uh, difficult on two aspects. Number one, you know, in order to solve any equation, you need to have understanding of the properties of your media. And the two fundamental properties that must be defined in Maxwell's equations are two things called the dielectric permeability and the dielectric permittivity. These two properties, essentially the permeability tells you um, if you if you subject a material to an external magnetic field, to what degree are the magnetic dipoles, you know, oriented or polarized? Uh, permittivity is the same thing for electric fields. You know, what is the polarizability that is induced in that material when you subject to, it to an electric field? These values or these properties are known to a certain degree, but on the microscopic scale, they're really kind of unknown. It's really still an issue of research. There, there are techniques such as MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, electron microscopy that can give us a better understanding, but um, Characterizing this is, is not a trivial matter for biological tissues. So in some sense, if you want to apply electromagnetic models to tissue, there's going to be some degree of approximation because we don't quite understand um, these fundamental properties. The other thing is, uh, which we'll see tomorrow, is that um, to solve wave equations in general are very computationally expensive. There have been uh, successful applications of rigorous Maxwell's equation solutions numerically um, to small systems like groups of cells. Um, the leaders in this field are uh, Vadim Bachman and Alan Tavlov at Northwestern and Andy Dunn um, and Rebecca Dresick 
who's at Rice, and he done at UT Austin, and they've done some really impressive work. And we we're, we're starting to do some work in this area where we actually um, leverage um, something called Huygens Fresnel's um, wavelet um, superpositions to, to actually solve Maxwell's equations uh, in an approximate limit, but one that, that is relevant for microscopy, and you'll hear about that tomorrow. So Maxwell's equations, in theory, can really span, uh, give you predictions for light transporting tissue that spans all spatial scales, from the microscopic you know, nanometer scale all the way out to you know, organ-based, but you're going to have to deal with this issue of computation, uh, computational cost associated with that. And it is because of the computational cost of this that people have, have sought other uh, approaches. So the first um, is the radiative transport equation. And instead of modeling light transport as propagation of waves, this deals with light transport in terms of the transport of neutral particles, photons. Okay. What's interesting is that you can actually derive the radiative transport equation from Maxwell's equation. As long as, I mean, there are actually many different assumptions, but the two key assumptions is that if you have a system with multiple scattering centers, you have to uh, assume that the particles are far enough away from each other such that each particle sees the far field of the scattering field, of the scattered field of the other particles. Which means that, in general, the particles need to be if the wavelength is large or on the same spatial scale of the particle itself, you know, there needs to be about space of two particles in between the two particles, you know. So you have to be in the far field. Or if the particles are small compared to the wavelength, the particles have to be uh, apart from each other by roughly one or two wavelengths, okay? Whether that's actually um, met in tissue is certainly up for debate. The other thing is that the, the tissue or the scatterers must be truly oriented in a spatially random manner. So there can be no correlations uh, in the positions of the particles because that would actually give rise to interference and coherent effects that could actually propagate over large spatial scales. Okay. So because you're treating light transport as particles without this wave characteristic, this, this is a scalar model in the case of, um, of standard radiator transport. And it can't predict interference and diffraction. However, there's a vector form of the radiative transport equation, which I'll introduce briefly, which can handle polarization effects. And you can write the radiative transport equation by writing this transport equation for what's called Stokes, uh, for each Stokes vector component of the light transport. And the Stokes vector is uh, a, a way, a parametric way, uh, way of capturing all of the polarization characteristics of a light field, and, and we'll talk about that. Now, by treating light as neutral particles, you can't quite um, capture everything on kind of a wavelength basis. You can, you can model light transport down to a spatial scale, which, uh, which is according to what's called the single scattering length, which we call L sub s. And in tissue, depending on the tissue, that length is on the order of anywhere from about 5 or 10 microns out to 200 microns. So the solutions that you get from radiative transport um, are, are, are valid, are um, down to about, you know, on the order of 10 microns at best. And, um, and the reason why we use it is that usually by that spatial scale, the light has gone through enough scattering interactions that you lose, that you lose any significant um, interference or diffraction. You get some random speckle, which can also be uh, modeled through through vector radiator transport. Now, even this equation, as we'll see very shortly, uh, can be um, difficult to handle, difficult to solve. Um, and even when it is solvable, at times, the computational cost may be prohibitive. Okay? You may not be able to get a solution fast enough for you to, to it, for it to be practical, given the situation. Although, Tremendous strides are being made in that regard. And so that's led people, certainly in the beginning of our field, you know, around 20 or 30 years ago, to seek truly analytic methods to solve. And this has given rise to the standard diffusion and PN equations. And many of you are familiar with this. It actually um, 
forms really the probably the most commonly used computational engine in our field. So this is an approximate solution to the radiator transport equation, okay? And it is formed by expanding the solution, and the solution to the radiator transport equation, which we'll talk about later, is, is in terms of a parameter called the radiance. And the radiance is a function in both space and propagation direction. Um, and what we do is that we approximate this space angle function through uh, an expansion in Legendre polynomials, which are a subset of spherical harmonics. And we'll talk about this in, in more detail up to some order n for, for pn. Now, when you use Legendre polynomials, you, you make this very significant assumption that your system is azimuthally symmetric. So if you have variation in angle, you only deal with variations in the polar angle, but not in the azimuthal angle. We'll talk about that soon. When you terminate at order n, you, you get a, a set of, of coupled uh, partial differential equations, n plus 1. And the easiest way to get something that's tract tractable is to basically just take the first order expansion, which leads you to the P1 approximation. And we'll, we'll outline that in detail later this week. Uh, and this has a long history of development in, and usage in biophotonics. And these predictions are very, very accurate in highly scattering media and at locations far away from sources and boundaries. And what we mean by far away uh, is that the distance has to be further than about a transport mean free path, which we call L star. And we'll discuss what L star is, how you derive it. But in the visible and near infrared, it's on the order of a millimeter. Okay. So typically, uh, if you derive solutions using the diffusion or P1 approximation, you really shouldn't trust it uh, at any locations that are a few millimeters away from a source or a boundary you're going to have some errors. And if your tissue isn't highly scattering, if absorption is, is you know, comparable or even you know, 10 or 20 percent of you know, relative to scattering, you, you may have some, some issues in the accuracy of this. And we'll, we're going to explore this definitely in the next few days. Okay. So let me just pause there. I've, I've gone through three different, very different kind of uh, pictures of how one can treat light propagation in a, in a turbid media, a media that both absorbs and scatters uh, light. And I'm going to move on to, to kind of a little bit more detail now, focusing a little bit more on the radiative transport equation and understanding uh, absorption and scattering. But at this point, I just thought maybe it would be a good time to open for questions. It's all pretty old hat for most of you. Yes? Does anyone actually use um, like the diffusion approximation or P equations, like diagnostically? Absolutely. So the diffuse optics, for instance, you know, where they use uh, red or near infrared light mm -hmm. to image or extract optical properties, say from brain or breast or whatever, that's what they're using. Typically, um, they use standard diffusion approximation based solvers to analyze their remitted light signals and extract optical properties and thereby physiological properties. So uh, we have Dave McClatchy is from Dartmouth and they've developed a tremendous suite of tools called NearFast, Near Infrared. I don't know what FAST stands for. Finite element something, yeah. Finite Yeah, so, um, and they, they, use you know, standard diffusion as well as higher order diffusion based solvers in a finite element way to do imaging of breast and other tissues. You can represent the tissue using finite element modeling. So this is actually the main workhorse certainly when you deal with tissues of, of, of moderate spatial scale, you know, several tens of millimeters. And you're going to get experience in using those this week, uh, using our software tools and exploring uh, the accuracy of diffusion-based solvers relative to rigorous radiative transport solvers, i.e. Monte Carlo. Okay. That's a good question. Yes, just uh, I understand that the, the RT yes. um, cannot model all the wave characteristics that Maxwell's yes. equations can yes. uh, capture. Um, <clears throat> but are there any other 
besides just scale, is there any like just type of medium that RT just cannot handle or anything? I'm reading the line about each particle lies in the far field. I'm just curious where that breaks down. Okay, so I guess you can answer this question from two perspectives. One is from the mathematical perspective, is that if you want to get the RTE from Maxwell's equations, you must invoke that assumption. Okay. Um, because what will happen is that if you hit these particles, uh, or if the particle, if one particle is in the near field of the other particle, you're just not going to achieve that limit. That being said, I imagine that tissue you have situations where you have particles in the near field of other particles. There's no question. Nevertheless, what likely happens is that we're extracting optical properties um, using by interpreting our signals as those that have come about through a solution to the radio transport equation. So we interpret those signals in a way that we get effective absorption and scattering coefficients. Now, whether the values of those absorption and scattering coefficients are then consistent with a electromagnetically rigorous description of those absorption and scattering coefficients, there may be some split there. Okay. Does that make a certain amount of sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and I'm going to talk about in a, in a few slides about um, how one can interpret uh, scattering coefficients <coughs> from a rigorous EM uh, basis and how we kind of use it in the radiate transport basis. And you can see maybe there could be a mismatch there. Okay. These are good questions. Any other questions? So I've heard yes. that before about mm -hmm. places where the diffusion approximation starts to break down. Yes. But I don't think I've ever been explained as to why that is. As to why. Okay. So we're going to discuss this, um, and I'll show you examples on Wednesday. But let me just tell you um, kind of um, more conceptually. Okay. So the standard diffusion approximation, actually, why don't we hold on? until I put up the radiate transport equation, and then I'll answer that. Maybe that'll be a little better. Uh, but if I forget, raise your hand. Okay, so we're, we're about, we're, we're gonna get there very soon. Any other questions? Okay, great, okay. So, um, therapy versus diagnostic. So this is my bad excuse of getting out a red laser pointer. So, you know, this is a diagram of my finger with this red laser pointer. I think even back there you can see my whole finger kind of glows, right? So there are a lot of applications where you where you use a collimated laser beam on tissue and you can even see red light coming out the other side. Right? So uh, the two issues we have here, the two um, light fields we can be interested in is first the internal light field, right? The light penetrates into my finger. Uh, it multiply scatters. You don't see a beam coming out the other side. It's kind of a diffuse glow. Um, and it's the internal light field that's really of significance if you want to do any sort of therapy, right? The total number of photons that are present or traveling or impinging at any given location in this tissue is um, local absorption of that light can either give rise to a temperature rise, okay, for a photothermal effect. It can also, it's also present to drive any photochemical reactions to maybe generate phototoxic species, right, which can be used for photodynamic therapy. And in some other cases, like diagnostics, it's also present there to be absorbed by a fluorophore, which then re-emits light, okay. So your internal light field is actually important not only for therapy, but also for diagnostics if you're dealing with fluorescence. Okay. And so we have this metric, which we call the fluence rate, which we'll discuss in, in more mathematically rigorous way in a few moments. We use this uh, Greek letter phi for that. And that has some decay with depth, and of course there's also some decay laterally. Okay. And so this metric of fluence rate is, is important for therapy and diagnostics. The efficacy of any therapy or, or, or fluorescence excitation depends on the light distribution within the tissue. 
Okay. Now, of course, because light is absorbed and multiply scattered, some of this light can, can, can come back out. And you certainly can see it on the other side of, well, you can't see it with the green laser pointer because there's too much absorption there. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. But you can either look at the light transmitted, or if you're smart, you can, that's, yeah, that's white light, there we go. Or you can image the surface of my finger to look at the reflectance, right? And, and that's what we, we leverage for diagnostics, right? We shine some sort of light. It could be a laser pointer. It could be a lamp. It could be any sort of, any sort of optical source. And we, in this case, in the simple case, where you have kind of a pencil beam incident on a tissue, you can look at the radial decay of either the reflectance or the transmittance. And we presume that we can say something about the tissue underneath by just looking at a projection of the light coming back out. And diagnostics and imaging are usually limited to light signals measured at the tissue boundaries, okay? So in one case here, we're really interested in the light field, light propagation internally. Here, we're looking at a projection of this very complex light field at the surface. And, and this is kind of the two different characterizations of, of uh, different aspects of light transport that we have to be concerned about. And we need to figure out how we can actually predict and get at these metrics from any sort of model. So, so the question is, is that how does you know, a photon which enters the tissue and experiences either depth through absorption or, uh, or um, or escape through reflectance or transmittance or rebirth through fluorescence. Um, how does that give rise to this, to this light field? Okay, so you guys have all seen this before. There are various fates that a, a photon can take, right? You can have light coming in at a certain oblique angle. There's going to be some specular reflectance as long as the medium has a different refractive index. There's some light that will enter the tissue. It can either multiply scatter and be re-emitted. This is sometimes called diffuse reflectance, which is kind of a misnomer because the light doesn't necessarily have to be diffuse. Um, we use diffuse reflectance just for all light that has entered the tissue and then comes back out through the front surface. We'll talk about diffuse versus non-diffuse light in a little bit. You can have absorption, which then gives rise to temperature rise or, um, or photochemical uh, reaction. We can have transmission and we can have absorption which then leads to, to, uh, to fluorescence. And so you can do some sort of photon balance here, making sure that you conserve energy, that all the light that basically you inject is accounted for through one of these four mechanisms. And this gives rise to some sort of light field. Okay, This is just a, a color uh, diagram of, of this light field. Um, depicting kind of a photon density. You know, if you look at any one location, you know, how many photons are actually traveling through that location? But it's a little more subtle, more subtle than that. And this gets at the whole issue of um, radiative transport equation and why diffusion might break down. So if you look at this location in the tissue, you can just kind of, through intuition, recognize that, well, most likely there's a lot of light that's kind of propagating towards the depth along a similar angle here, right? There's probably a lot of light coming in this direction. And you see this lateral dispersion, right? There's, there's a decay of light in this direction. There's actually a fair bit of light to the left-hand side. So actually, there's probably more light traveling uh, to the right than to the left, right? Because there's not much of a gradient. <coughs> so, and then there's not so much light that's traveling back. You know, so you have what's called the, you have an angular function here that, that uh, communicates in what directions the photons are traveling away from that point. So one is, if you want a complete description of what's going on here, you can't be satisfied with just understanding what are the number of photons that are traveling through a given location at any given time. You need to consider what directions they're traveling. So from a radiative transport perspective, the most fundamental quantity of 
characterizing this light transfer is something called the radiance. Uh, we use L as the variable, and it's a function of position, which makes sense, but it's also a function of a direction, which we call omega. Omega is the propagation direction of the photon. And then, of course, if your light source is turning on and off, uh, it, can, it can change with time. Okay? The units of this is, are very telling. Watts is energy per unit time. So it's photons per unit time. How many photons are hitting that location per unit time? The number of photons hitting that location per unit time varies, um, varies with space, and it varies with propagation direction. You do it per unit area in that little spot, and per unit solid angle, right? Because you have, of course, this is just a 2D projection, but this is area in this plane, but it's also the area outside the plane. So there's a unit sphere that can be defined around any point. And so this is a function of both space and direction. Okay. And it's how we approximate this function in space and direction in standard diffusion, which makes it break down in cases where absorption is comparable to scattering, and we'll talk about that in more detail. So why this is a, a complicated function of, of space and angles because light both absorbs and scatters. And so first we need to understand how light absorbs and scatters individually, and then we have to put them together in the appropriate way to get um, to get um, radiative transport equation. Maybe I'll pause here for any questions. People comfortable with the radiance? It's not talked about enough, I think, in my view, in, in, uh, in our field. Um, the reason why the radiance is so important is that all other metrics can be, um, in radiative transport can be derived from the radiance, um, both both the fluence rate that I've shown up here and reflectance and transmittance. Once you have the radiance, you can derive all of these other things. Okay. That is to say, you can maybe make guesses at those things without having the radiance, but if you do have the radiance, you can get everything else. Yes, Isaac. Um, so how is, or is coherence of the light in any way tied to the radiance? So first we're in radiative transport. So we're non modeling coherence. Coherence is a wave phenomenon. Right, right. Okay. I'm just trying to make the connection in my head. I'm, I'm not sure if it matters. I don't think it does. Okay. Um, all the radiance tells you, it tells you what is the spatial variation of light, and at any location, what, are, what is the variation in the direction of propagation of light. Coherence has to do more with, you have multiple waves, are they going in phase or out of phase, mm -hmm. and do you have a coherent wave front? Here, in multiple light scattering, we assume that all coherent wave fronts have been basically um, fallen apart due to multiple scattering in a random medium. So is the, is the watt unit, it, the photons per unit time, I just feel like the mm -hmm. coherence would affect that somehow. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a connection uh, mm -hmm. per se because coherence really, like I said, it has to do with whether uh, the electric magnetic wave are, are, are propagating in phase or out of phase. Mm -hmm. Here, remember, we've lost all coherence. So all we're interested in as far as the energy it, mm -hmm. at any given location is what are the total number of photons that are emanating from that location at a given time. And so if you integrate this, which we'll talk about later, you can get the total fluence rate. So don't think of it in an electromagnetic wave context. You really have to think of it in terms of a photon context. Okay. Jerry, might you have an interpretation that might? No, I, I think what you said is exactly right. Uh, if you stay within RPE modeling, then it's very difficult to make a connection between that and the EM effects as Watson said. So I think um, there's more in the inform more information in the two equations, Maxwell's equations and RTE equations, and 
stop to think about it, scattering in the RTE is just a scalar scattering function, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas you, if in, in um, max, you, if you want to model the Stokes vector, you have a four-dimensional sort of scattering structure. And that doesn't capture all of the coherent effects either. But so it's, it's as he said, it's complicated. I don't think there's a quick answer. There's no direct, uh, you know, again, in, in Maxwell's equations, the primitive is the electric and magnetic field, right? Mm -hmm. And from the electric field, you actually have to do the, the square of the electric field to get the power. Right. right. Here, you can only get down, the electric field directly isn't measurable, right? Right. right. Uh, here, the only, we only go down to the limit of energy. We, we lost the field information. I see. Okay, maybe that helps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, there's no phase information in the radio transport equation. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Okay. That's a good question. Any other questions? Okay. Good. So we've gone through this. Okay, so we're going to go through some very basic stuff, but then it's all preparation for, for radio transfer. So you've probably all seen this. Um, it's just a way of explaining Beer's law for absorption. So if we want to understand how the radiance uh, gets attenuated due to absorption. So I'm doing something a little different here. I'm saying let us consider, so in this, so here we have, say, a small container, a cuvette, a slab, which you have some absorbing uh, material in. And we're interested in, we just parameterize the position within the, um, the slab with uh, the, the variable s. And we're only looking at light traveling in one direction, omega. And this direction is perpendicular to the edge of the slab. And so we're interested in how this radiance uh, varies um, with S in this material. And we're only interested in, in this one direction of make. So the derivative, the rate at which L would change with S, we presume, is linearly proportional to how much absorption there is here, which we'll call mu sub A. And it's linked to the incident amount of light coming out here, right? And so if we integrate this, the, um, we get Beer's law, right? That, that the variation in the radiance in this cuvette is linked to the incident radiance times an exponential um, that's proportional to something called the absorption coefficient mu a. Okay. Mu a, we'll talk about where mu a comes from in a little bit, but we'll, we refer to it as an absorption coefficient. It has units of inverse length, okay? The key thing here I want to mention is twofold. First, once the photon is absorbed, it's gone, right? It no longer propagates. Number two, if you look in this material, if it's purely absorbing, there are only photons that propagate in this one direction omega. There are no other photons that are traveling in any other direction. So if you look at any point in that medium, um, Instead of having this kind of very round or elliptical distribution, you would have none of this. You'll have only one direction, which is you know perpendicular. Okay, you have a, a delta function in angle. Put it another way. Okay, there's the only way you get propagation in a diversity of directions is through scattering or through a light source which is emitting light in multiple directions. So you can consider scattering in the same way. So again, if we confine our attention to the variation of radiance with a location s and direction omega in a material that is purely scattering now, okay, you come up with a similar Beer's law where the drop off in the light traveling in that direction omega with s falls off with some scattering coefficient. Now the issue here is that you get this seemingly the same Beer's law, but just remember that those photons aren't gone, they're just starting to travel in different directions. So you've lost it from this given omega, but now they're traveling in other 
directions of maybe. Okay? And the OS is given by the scattering coefficient. It has to do with the number of scatterers you have. It also have inverse length. And if you combine absorption and scattering together, you get a, mo a different types of Beer's law. If you want to see the extinction of light in this in this uh, direction omega, you can just sum the absorption and scattering properties. And this is only true when your these samples are very very thin. If they're thicker, then you have to deal with the fact that the photons that are scattered in other directions, if they undergo enough scattering events, they may get rescattered back into that initial direction. Okay, and that's that will lead us to the radio transport equation. Yes? Is that a thing? Uh, I think maybe we are considering mm -hmm. the radius along a specific uh, omega, right? That's correct. And uh, but the thing is, when we are considering scattering, uh, that means that when we lose photons, uh, which were Yes. So we move some photons to the other directions. That's right. But I, I think at the same time they also pick up some photons right. from the other, other. You're correct. So in this way, how maybe, how will you like uh, describe how will we dis distribution inside the medium? Okay. Right, and that's what we're going to do in the next slide. Oh. So so that's no very good question. Okay, so you you captured this correctly. You know. I use these very simple descriptors just to show you that you can, you need to account for the light both in space and angle. But you're very correct that if you have multiple scattering, as I've kind of depicted here, there is the probability that even once you have this first scattering event, you can undergo a couple scattering events, and then maybe you'll come out in the same direction that you came in, um, and that's true. And we have to account for that. So, so, and that's what we're going to do right now. But that's absolutely correct. So. So, and that's this wonderful equation, okay? And so this can be quite daunting when you first look at it. And it certainly took me a long time, actually, to really understand this equation. So the first thing is that don't be intimidated. Um, it's essentially a global balance for propagation of photons. So let's just start and understand this term by term. So on the left-hand side, we have a term, which is the time rate of change. Uh, right? It's the partial derivative of the radiance, which again can be a function of location. Okay, so R is just a vector, x, y, z location. Angle, which in spherical coordinates we'll see is represented by two angles, a polar angle and an azimuthal angle. And time, right, because your source can be varying with time. You're just saying, if you're considering one direction and one angle, how does that change with time? We're also multiplying this by one over the velocity of propagation. Okay, the velocity of propagation is the speed of light in vacuum divided by the refractive index. In reality, it's, it's probably better to multiply this whole equation by v, because basically what's happening is that you're having light that's propagating at velocity v. Okay, so you can think of this as just the time rate of change and then put a v in front of each of these. But just to, for compactness, I, I just divide the whole equation by v. So we're just trying to figure out, okay, how can this, how can the, the light that, that travels or that is impinging at this location, how can it change with time? So it will take on a positive value if you're getting more photons traveling as a function of in that location and that direction of time, and it'll go down if you have fewer. Okay. One way that you can lose light is that, well, it's just flowing away, right? Photons never sit still, right? They're always propagating. This is a directional derivative. It's basically the spatial gradient of the radiance. It's the variation in space. And the projection of that gradient onto the direction that you're looking at. Now, this, comes, this kind of formation of, of this term comes about by drawing a differential volume element and just looking at the flux of light coming out of the surface of that volume element. And then if you hit that with Gauss's divergence theorem, you get, a, you get this gradient operator and you get a volumetric integral. And then you can drop the volumetric integrals. But essentially, this is just a flow of light 
out of that differential volume and the projection of that onto the direction that you're considering. So this is just the flow of light out, which would be a loss, negative time rate of change. To get the flow of light in, you have to hit that with the negative sign. Okay. Without the negative sign, this is a loss, but you're going to have positive time rate of change for increases, so you have to hit this with the negative. So that's one way you can lose light, it just propagates away. The other way you can lose light, again, light at that location and direction, is due to interaction, right? Either it gets absorbed, it's gone, or it gets scattered, right? It, now, the photon isn't gone, but it's gone from that direction omega, as you pointed out, right? So this is just the sum of the absorption and the scattering coefficients. This term here in the curly bracket is the loss. Since we're looking at time rate of change, we need gains, so we put a negative sum there. Okay? So these are two ways we can lose light, okay? either from propagation or due to absorption and scattering. But we can gain light. As, um, is your name Faye? Yeah, yeah Faye, as Faye pointed out. You can have light that propagates at, from other directions, omega prime, that undergo scattering at that location r, and then get propagates in the, in the direction that we're considering, which is omega. OK, so how do we account for that, all of those photons, reversely? Well, first, we need to write down, OK, what, are, what is all of the light at that location r that propagates in other directions, omega prime? Okay, so this gives us the, the distribution of light traveling at other directions, you know, at a given location r. And then we have to say, well, if we, have, if we know the, the amount of light propagating in omega prime, what is the probability that that light will be scattered from omega prime into omega? Okay? So you may have a lot of light going into, uh, traveling at omega prime, but there could be maybe a very small probability that's going to be scattered into the angle you're interested in. Or sometimes you may have little light, but there's a high probability. So you have to do that. And then you have to consider all of these other angles and make a prime. Just all the angles theta phi on the unit sphere. And so this integral is an integral over a unit sphere. And we'll, we'll unpack that in just a little bit, how you actually do that integral. Um, so you're integrating over all these other directions. And this p function, which we call the single scattering phase function, it's a bad name, it has nothing to do with phase, it has nothing to do with coherence, it's just a probability distribution function. It's normalized, so you still have to say, well, if scattering, if there's a lot of scattering here, you're going to have to multiply by, you know, you're going to have to, to get the absolute amount of light, you have to multiply that scattering coefficient. So this is a gain, that's why we have a plus here, right? It's the gain of light you get from other directions of mega prime that gets scattered into omega, and then you have gain from sources there's any source in the medium that you have to characterize the, those sources, um, the spatial variation of those sources, and the angular variation, right? You could have a beam of light coming in that has a spatial variation. This, the, the laser beam has a diameter, but it's also coming in at only one direction, as opposed to there are cases where you have an interstitial fiber that's embedded in tissue that glows in all directions, right? That would have a different variation in space and direction. Okay? So that has to be characterized. Okay, any questions on this? So if you account for you know, your source and then you gain the scattering and the loss of the yeah. scattering and your loss to the streaming effect, what actually causes this time rate of change? If you account for it, say this again. Well, um, so I mean, you have your source, mm -hmm. right? And that's sort of your sorting, your starting block of photons. Right. The tissue. But then there's this last variable that you have to account for the time rate of change. So what's actually the cause of that? Because I mean I can see how the photons, how you're losing and gaining photons through those other through middle parameters, but what's causing the Well it, it is the sum of all of these that gives rise to time rate of change. Now in a case where you have a steady laser source, uh, like this laser pointer, that time rate of change will be zero. Okay? So in a case, you know, so 
That does, you're always having photons that are traveling around. It's not a static picture. Remember, the photons are always traveling. The radiance is watts. It's photons per unit time. So, but if you have a, a constant laser beam, you're dealing with what's called the steady state case, where this is set to zero. Now, if you have a source that's going on and off, then you're going to have a time rate of change at any given location. Am I right. answering your question? Yeah, I'm sorry. So I guess my question is, is that variable that time rate of change only for changing sources or in the non-steady state, I guess? It's always for non-steady state. That's, that's going to be zero in, in the steady state case. Um, that's right. Um, of course, you know, you can have fluorescence, but fluorescence again is that if you have a steady excitation source, that fluorescent emission is going to be steady. Um, you know, if you don't have photo bleaching and things like that, that degrade that fluorophore. But, you know, you have frequency domain photon migration and you have frequency domain fluorescence. All of that is generated because the source is intensity modulated and that gives rise to a time-varying light field. Did I get, did I get your question, Adrian? Or yeah, you I seem a little just, unsatisfied still. Well, I, just, I guess I always think maybe in steady state. Uh -huh. It's not used to even seeing that very yeah. well. Yeah. It seems like, can you just account for that in the source, uh, the gain from the source, uh, the variability of the... Well, remember, the you're, no, not exactly, because remember, we're trying to characterize the light field everywhere in the tissue, okay? So the source may occupy a certain location in space, but if that source is turning on and off, and I want to characterize the radiance somewhere else, that radiance function has to vary with time. And that's what this L is. L characterizes the light everywhere in the tissue as a function of space, time, and direction. So if you have a source that's turning on and off, the light field in other locations in the tissue are not going to be steady. They're going to be turning on and off as well. And you have to have a function that ha has time variation in order to account for that. Okay. Jerry, do you want to say something? I'm, I'm struggling a little bit to understand how to explain it differently. Um, you're not talking about the spatial gradient term, are you? The second term on the first term on the right? No, I, I, I mean, I think you answered it. I, I guess my conclusion is that you would just see equations for things on the steady state or something. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I don't think I can add anything to what Boston said. So we're going to see both the steady state and the time dependent case later this week. So this week we're going to go through kind of the four canonical, diffuse. Um, optics technologies. The first is spatially resolved diffuse reflectance, where you put in a steady light source into a material and you just look at the light field and you use the spatial characteristics of that light field to infer something about optical properties. But they recognize there's some limitations to that. Then the next technology was, well, let's put in a pulse of light and let's look at the time course of that emission uh, at various locations. And that it, that requires a solution to this time-dependent equation. You put in a delta function or a very short impulse, and if you look at other locations, you don't get an impulse anymore. You get a very broad, um, broad rise and fall of light because of multiple scattering. And then you can think of these things in the, in the frequency domains, right? You can, you can pulse the light on and off in time, or you can actually shine light sources in spatial patterns. Those are kind of the the temporal and spatial Fourier domain of this equation, which we'll address on days three through five of the workshop. Okay? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Jay. Um, I have a question regarding RT, but maybe for previous slides. And uh, you mm -hmm. said one of the definitions of uh, using RT is uh, the particles and the particle, for example, one particle should lie in the far view mm -hmm. of the other one. Yes. So in practice, how do you guarantee that this, this you know, requirement? You, you, you can't guarantee that particles in tissue all lie in the far field of the other particles. So on some level, so again, I think, I think you asked, or someone else asked, 
the question, you know, about the, you know, yes, Joseph, I think, asked the question about that. And I think there's two aspects to that. One is you must make that assumption in order to track BRT back to Maxwell's equations. That being said, maybe you don't really care about Maxwell's equations, right? You just start with the RTE. So that just means that the absorption and scattering coefficients that you derive from the RTE may not be traceable all the way back to a Maxwell's context, but are still valid within a radiative transport aspect. And we're gonna talk about absorption and scattering properties in just a second, and we can revisit this yeah. issue. Um, yeah, Jerry, I, I think was we'll make in response to that question. Yeah. Um, remember, this is a treatment of uh, radiation as particles only, and so when you uh, when you try to capture, I think your question amounts to this one: uh, Can we assume that the population of photons that's considered as particles is small compared to the population of everything else? that the photons will scatter with. Okay, so there are no photon-photon interactions accounted for here. The answer is yes, that is an assumption. Otherwise, the equation wouldn't be linear. It's a linear equation. So we are ignoring photon-photon interactions. Um, well, I think there's also another aspect, but this is a very good question. The other, the other thing that we're assuming is, remember, this single scattering phase function is typically a representation of if you have a plane wave or, or a photon traveling in one direction hitting a particle, what is the angular distribution of the scattered line? That angular distribution is measured in the far field, far away from the particle, right? Now that distribution, if you're very, very close to the particle, may be different. And so that's, that's also another aspect of that. And so this issue of particle-particle interactions or the, the scattering field of one particle not achieving the far field limit before it interacts with the next particle, it breaks down. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Okay. We're going to talk about that more. Any other questions? Good. Okay, the other thing which I refer to is that you can actually um, model polarization effects. And this is a vector radiative transport equation. It's essentially the same equation. I've just replaced L with another letter I, and the I is bold because it's a vector. Okay? And I've replaced the single scattering phase function with something called Z, which is a matrix, actually. So basically, one can parameterize all the polarization characteristics of a field using something called the Stokes vector. The first three elements completely characterize the linear polarization characteristics, and the last component, B, characterizes the circular polarization characteristics. And you can, you can write a vector radiative transport equation for that. You, know, you need to know the polarization characteristics of your source, which means that you need to know the I, Q, U, and V characteristics of that source. If it's a linearly polarized source, you can actually compute that. I think it's just 1, 0, 0, 0, or Q, 0, 0, 0, 0. The other thing you need to know is you need to know this uh, scattering matrix Z, which tells you, well, if I have, you know, you know x amounts of i, y amounts of q, z amounts of u, and k amounts of v, if I hit a particle, how is that going to be re-scrambled? So z is a 4 by 4 matrix, which essentially tells you how you have an incident wave or incident particle with polarization i, q, u, and v. Once it hits that particle, what is the i, q, u, v characteristics of that scattered? And so this is basically four equations. Okay, for each of these components. And from an electromagnetic perspective, the Z matrix can be derived through solutions of Maxwell's equations for scattering the particle. Okay. We won't talk about it that much here, but except to say that vector radiator transport is actually used in our field 
to a certain degree, there are many groups that are using polarization as a way to gate photons that are penetrated superficially or deeply in a tissue and to try to extract microstructural properties. And so if you want to treat that phenomenon rigorously, one has to address this equation. And the Stokes vector formalism is just one. There are many other formalisms to treat this. Um, the Jones matrix formalism is, is another one, for example. But I just want to tell you that you can treat polarization within this scalar or within this particle-based context. Okay, so, so I, I started all of this, uh, got us into to this mathematical uh, detail, uh, but I want to get us back out to addressing this question of uh, diagnostics versus therapy. And I said I was going to um, unpack these integrals a little bit. So let's go back to... So say we can solve this equation. We solve the RTE. We know L everywhere. We know this spatial angular function. So the question is, well, from the RTE solution, how do we calculate the total light present at any given location? Okay, so that's the fluence rate. The fluence rate tells you what are the total amount of photons that are emanating from a certain location. So, so say this is a location in, in, a, in a turbid media, in a tissue, and this is some angular variation of light. This is an arbitrary shape, and of course, this is only a 2D projection, right? It's, it has a shape around the surface of the sphere. So what we need to do is that we need to integrate L over all of these directions, okay? And S2 is just a fancy way of saying integration over the unit sphere, okay? So you've got to consider all d omega. Okay, so how do you do this integral? Okay, it's nice to write that integral. How do you do it? Well, what's important to know is, you know, we're looking at the unit sphere, so we've got to look at spherical coordinates, okay? So we have our Cartesian coordinates, x, y, z. There are two angles that one has to, to, to locate any position on the unit sphere. Unit sphere is just a sphere of radius one. Any two positions on the unit sphere are, uh, is uniquely identified by a polar angle, which is the angle off of the z-axis, and the azimuthal angle, the rotation around the xy plane, beta and phi. So I've drawn in red here, I tried to draw a differential surface element of that unit sphere. Okay. And this, um, this area of this unit sphere is essentially given the, this rotation, this bottom, um, I don't know, bottom uh, surface or uh, bottom uh, side of this, um, this rectangular, pseudo rectangular element is given by sine theta delta phi, right? So you have two pi phi going around, so this tells you uh, uh, the, the rotation around the z axis, and the length of this arm is scales with sine theta because if you're at along, if you're at the z axis, that has zero dimension, and if you're at the y axis, you basically have delta phi. And then this arc is given by r delta theta. Now, since you have a unit sphere, r is one, and so you have delta theta. So essentially, this element is given by sine theta delta phi delta theta. So you need to do this integration. So here I have sine theta delta theta delta phi to integrate over the whole unit sphere. You have to essentially scan theta from zero to pi. And at every theta, you go around the z-axis in phi from zero to two pi. Okay, so you only have to go in theta from zero to pi because at every given theta, you're going around the whole sphere. So by the time you get to pi, you've done the whole sphere. You don't have to go from pi back to two pi. That would be counting the sphere twice. Okay, okay so that's so if you have this function, and this is making no assumptions about what L can be. L can be any function. Okay. So that tells you the light field within the tissue. Now, so that's 
So now we're interested, say, the other thing we can be interested in is what is the light field that we detect emitted, the light emitted from the tissue. So let's look at the reflectance, for instance. Okay, so here what I've done is that I've shown the light field just in the tissue underneath, so there's light coming that's propagating inwards due to multiple scattering. And there's light that comes out, and you'll see that there's actually a discontinuity here, right? Unlike before, there's this nice, smooth function. Here there's a discontinuity. The discontinuity arises because there may be a refractive index mismatch, and we'll talk about that discontinuity later. But what we're interested in is, what is how do we calculate all the light that comes out? Okay. So instead of integrating over the whole unit sphere, we're just interested in the hemisphere, a half sphere, that's propagating outwards, in this case in the negative z direction. So what I want to do is that I want to take the radiance at a location r, which is just on the other side of this boundary. So the boundary is z equals 0. Z adopts positive values within the medium, negative values in the air, say, around it. We want to look at this radiance just on the other side of this medium. And we need to take the projection of that onto the outward pointing normal. So we hit this with the dot product of negative z, because we want the outward pointing normal. Um, so we take the projection of any given light ray. It's traveling at any arbitrary location omega. You do the projection on the negative z axis. You hit that with L. And you just do that integration over the hemisphere where the propagation direction of the light, uh, the dot product of that, with the inward pointing z axis is negative. Right? That will ensure that you get everything in the backward hemisphere. And then um, you, know, that's, you can use a fancy descriptor S2 minus, which means the outward pointing hemisphere and then we can unpack it, okay? Any questions on, whoa, I'm going way too far ahead. Any questions? Okay, yes? Um, when you have the vector radius transformation, yes. I was wondering, can that account for things like bad frequency or bad conditions? Absolutely. Um, Although, um, one has to characterize, one thing that I've, I hid, in the RTE is that I wrote, okay, there are two aspects that one has to deal with here. One is the fact that your optical properties in birefringent divergent can be, it's varying with direction. Okay. And it can vary with location. Okay. Now, in general, um, the general form of, of the radiative transport equation can allow you to do that. Um, I've written the, the scattering matrix or the phase function in a general form, in a form where you can have any mapping from omega prime to omega. In reality, when we do the analytic approximations, we tend to make an assumption that the phase function is only dependent on the mutual orientation of those two angles, the dot point. That will break down in the case of birefringence, because in birefringent material, you have absolute orientations for that phase function. And so there, in order to solve the RTE, you have to keep track of absolute orientations in the laboratory reference frame. Okay. So, the RTE can be written in a way that allows you to have spatially varying optical properties and the phase function that is cognizant of the fact that you have an absolute reference frame. Now, solving that in a simpler fashion analytically may be more difficult because you can't leverage um, the fact that you're in a purely random media. The other thing you have to worry about is that in a birefringent, if you have very good ordering, you can still preserve wave effects over large distances. Depends on here. It's unlikely in biological materials, but it can still happen. Jerry, do you want to comment on this? No, I okay. Think that's, yeah, good. that's a very good question. Okay. Issues of birefringence. Um, any other questions? Okay. So now I'm I'm going to really change gears, and so we're going to set aside the math. Well, 
not entirely, but mostly, and talk about optical properties in tissues. Okay. So this is now a very famous slide or graphic that was developed by Steve Jocks many years ago to kind of communicate to, to all of us the complexity, diversity, and the spatial span of spatial scales of structures within cells and tissues that can be responsible for scattering light. All the way from structures on the orders of, of tens of nanometers, you know, lipid bilayers, uh, protein aggregates um, that have, represent, because they're made out of proteins or lipids, they have different refractive index relative to the surrounding aqueous media and can scatter light, albeit weakly. There are other things, um, you know, protein aggregates, macromolecular aggregates. Collagen is not a uniform fibril, but has, has variations. Um, the striations in, in the collagen fibrils can give rise to scattering. All of these structures have characteristic dimensions that are roughly less than 100 nanometers. And scattering generated by such structures have special characteristics. Um, it's called Rayleigh scattering here, but it's really not a different type of scattering relative to me scattering. It's really me scattering in the Rayleigh limit, in the limit where the particle itself is much smaller than the wavelength of that. Then you have other larger aggregates, um, you know, various endosomes, lysosomes, vesicles and tissues in, in cells. Mitochondria, which generate, you know, generate ATP, uh, the kind of fuel that cells run on. Nuclei, the information center of the cells. Cells themselves. The other thing that's missing here are the extracellular proteins, which support the tissue. You know, collagen fibrils, elastins, glycosaminoglycans. They all have characteristic dimensions on the order of a few hundred nanometers on upwards. And all of these structures have spatial, spatial characteristics that are on the same size scale of the wavelength of light in the visible and near infrared, or even larger. And that gives rise to characteristic scatterings, characteristic of what's called me scattering. And so I just want to discuss those two aspects. The first thing I want to do is just kind of give you the more complicated wave picture of scattering, which will be discussed in much more detail tomorrow. But just want to give you understanding that let's just look at a particle, which can scatter. It could be a Rayleigh or a mean particle. You could have incident light that's coming in from the bottom to the top. And it has some sort of incident electric field. And you can define a parallel or perpendicular um, polarization component that is defined relative to the scattering plane. So we are defining a plane at a given theta and phi of interest. And in that context, you have an incident electric field. And the scattered field that arises through that is defined by some sort of scattering amplitude function, meaning that basically gives you a mapping of how the incident parallel and perpendicular components of the electric field contribute to the parallel and perpendicular components of the scattered field. Okay. This can be solved for through Maxwell's equations. Okay. And is solved for in simpler situations um, you know, in these scattering. And then this term here just uh, characterizes the scattered field, which is done. The, the field that's scattered, that's generated by this particle, is the natural coordinate system, is a spherical coordinate system. So this is just a propagating spherical wave, has that characteristic. And we'll see that tomorrow. And then you have generally these four functions which describe the mapping of each polarization component of the incident field to each polarization component of the scattered field. Now, in the case where you have a spherical scatterer, this simplifies because you don't have any azimuthal dependence. And this goes down to only two elements. But you'll see that tomorrow. I don't want to steal it. So the reason why I mention this is that this tells you the amount of scattered light that is generated by an incident wave. And that is linked to the scattering coefficient. So this is a simpler diagram where you have a scatterer, you have a plane wave, you have an incident wave, you have a scattered field. And if you have a detector far away from this particle, more like down here, and you 
you detect the amount of light here, it's going to be reduced relative to the instant light field. And the scattering cross-section of this particle is defined as the area of a perfectly absorbing index match disk that is necessary to produce the measured reduction of light. So say I take away this particle, I put in a black disk that has the same refractive index. So there's no scattering whatsoever. How large does that disk need to be in order to produce the measured reduction of light that you get from the scatter? That is what the absorption, the scattering cross-section is. And this is parameterized by, so this is related to the relative intensities of the, of the scattered wave. So this is the, the square of the electric field, scattered wave divided by the instant wave and the wave vector for proper normalization. And this can be um, described by the scattering efficiency times the actual uh, size of the scatter. And so it turns out that actually a scatterer can, uh, the scattering efficiency can actually be um, a value that goes from zero to two. Actually, a scatterer can actually uh, you may need a, an absorbing disk that's twice as big as the scattering disk due to diffraction. And the reason why I'm going through scattering cross-section is because once you have the scattering cross-section, you can derive the scattering coefficient. The scattering coefficient is just the scattering cross-section times the number density of scatterers, the number of scatterers per unit volume. Okay, so scattering cross-section it has units of area, number density of scatterers is number per unit volume you get. Per unit length. Okay, and it's the, basically the mean free path for photon travel. Just want to give very quickly, since I'm running over, um, very quickly some characteristics of Rayleigh scattering. First thing I want you to recognize is that, remember, Rayleigh scattering is the limit where the particle is really small compared to the wavelength of light. So the wavelength of light, it's, so just think about it from the particle point of view, it's experiencing an oscillation in the electric field. The wavelength is huge. So basically, the whole particle is, represents one oscillating dipole. And so what happens is the re-radiation of light, scattering is really re-radiation of light. That whole thing is oscillating, and it gives rise to actually a scattered field which is very gently varying with, with angle. It depends on the polarization, whether the electric field is oscillating this way or this way. If it's uh, parallel polarized light, you get this kind of double lobed structure. If it's perpendicularly polarized light, it's perfectly isotropic. And if it's non-polarized, you get the average of the two. What's very important here is that I want to emphasize is that there's equal amounts of light scattered forward and backward. There's no bias, okay? A Rayleigh scatterer will scatter equal amounts of light in the forward hemisphere and the backward hemisphere. The other thing that I want to emphasize is that it has very strong dependence on the particle radius, which I described by A, and it is inversely proportional to the fourth power of wavelength, okay? This is why the sky is blue, right? Because the atmosphere is predominantly composed of Rayleigh scatterers, you scatter much more blue light than you do red light. Okay? Angular distribution is symmetric, varies generally. M is the relative refractive index, the refractive index of the particle relative to the mean. Okay? And this gives you uh, the exact solution for the scattering cross section of really. Now, this is very different once you go to a me scatter. A me scatter, again, now the particle is huge compared to the wavelength. Wavelength's really small, which means that you can think that in one location of the particle is experiencing a different part of the field than another particle. So you have, you can think of a particle as composed as many, many different dipoles, which are all oscillating, may not be in the same phase. And so when you look far, far away, you get interference of all of these dipoles in the far field. And what that gives rise to is a very, very um, uh, structured um, angular distribution of light. So this is a 10 micron water droplet in air, the angular distribution. And this is on a log scale. Okay, so I want to emphasize this, is that most of the light is strongly forward scattered. You see this peak at, at theta equals zero. And you get very, very little light scattered off of this forward peak. This is 
Again, the law of distribution. So this background here is about one, two, more than two orders of magnitude below that peak. Okay? This is a very large particle. It's 10 microns. Um, wavelength like 650, and it's in air. So there's a strong refractive index of snatch. There's a nice um, empirical correlation for the reduced scattering cross-section. And it's valid for particles of these sizes. But the key thing here is that because you have all of these different oscillating dipoles, you get all of these interference effects. Okay? And you get highly structured angular distributions, a lot of light, most of the light scattered forward. Okay, so why does this all matter? Okay, let's get back to tissue. So in tissues, you have mixtures of Rayleigh and Z scatterers, um, rigorous derivation of scattering spectra and scattering characteristics are really difficult. There are two parameters that are really important. One is the reduced or isotropic scattering coefficient, called Mios prime. It's formed by a multiplication of the scattering coefficient times 1 minus g. g is the single scattering asymmetry or anisotropy coefficient, which is the average, uh, the average of the cosine of scattering angle. OK, so g takes on values between minus one and one. If something scatters light completely forward, you would have a g of one. If it scatters light completely backwards, it would be negative one. If you have equal amounts of light scattered forward or backwards, you have zero. Okay. Rayleigh scatters have g of equal zero by definition. Um, Me scatters usually have very high, these, uh, high values of g, 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.95, 0 0.9999. You know. So, the reason why this is important is that um, the reduced scattering coefficient kind of puts particles that scatter light isotropically and particles that, light, that scatter light very strongly forward on kind of equal footing, right? Because if you have a very, very large G, it's like the light hasn't been scattered much at all, right? It's basically scattered directly forward. So you have to encounter, or the photon has to encounter multiple, multiple scattering events before the direction of the light becomes randomized. Okay? So you see that even though you may have a high scattering coefficient, if the G is large, the reduced scattering coefficient is really small. Okay? But if G is zero, you know, that one particle does a very good job in randomizing the directions, right? Because it scatters the light everywhere in all directions. And so mu s prime is about equal to mu s. Now tissue can be modeled as a mixture of Rayleigh and these scatterers. We typically adopt one or two functional forms of the wavelength dependence. You just, I just want to recall that the, the, the wavelength dependence for Rayleigh scattering is one over lambda to the fourth. It's very strong inverse. Here in this empirical, it's lambda to one over lambda to the minus 0.4. Okay, it's, it's much more modest. So people have fit the reduced scattering coefficient to a single exponential uh, of the, uh, that, the uh, single exponential related to a normalized wavelength, or a combination of two exponent or two power laws, not exponentials, excuse me, power laws, one that decays as uh, inverse fourth power, and one that is decays with another power that's related to mean scale. And you kind of say, well, I have a fraction, the tissue is composed of a fraction of Rayleigh scatterers, and the balance of scatterers are mean scatterers, or one minus the Rayleigh scatterers. Steve Jacques has come up with a beautiful uh, recent review paper that has a comprehensive um, uh, anthology in some sense of, of uh, optical properties of tissues. And here is the relationship between this B me exponent and B. So if you have very few Rayleigh scatterers, the B that you would get by fitting your spectra to this simplified power law to this more complicated power law would be the same, right? So tissues that fall along this diagonal basically have very little Rayleigh scatterers. Their scattering is dominated by large scatterers. Ones that fall off means that you have significant Rayleigh scattering. Okay. And this does a similar thing. It relates this ratio between this B me coefficient to the regular B here to the fraction of Rayleigh scatterers. Okay, so the the ones that fall off the diagonal have larger Rayleigh contributions. You can look at this paper; it's a really a really nice paper. 
The other thing that you should bear in mind is that this pre factor A tells you kind of the strength of scattering within a tissue. And so this is the factor A, this is the sc reduced scatter coefficient at 500 nanometers. That's a function uh, of different tissue types. Varies around from about seven or eight per millimeter down to about one per millimeter, okay? And again, I know the graphic quality isn't very good. You can consult the paper. And then also you have this angular variation in scattering, this anisotropy coefficient. And this is kind of a depiction of the angular variation. The thing I want to note here is that the tissues that have a very weak dependence in anisotropy, those are tissues that are dominated by me scatterers, right? Because it's the Rayleigh scatterers that, that scatter light more isotropically. The ones that fall off here, they fall off at lower wavelengths where the particles are small compared to the wavelength of light, and you have the B contribution showing up there by drop in G. So, um, a little bit about absorption. Um, I'll go through this really quickly. I just want you to be aware of that if you look at absorption spectra in the literature, you want to make sure whether you're getting information from a chemist or a physicist, okay? The chemists um, extract a molar extinction coefficient using a ratio of transmitted intensity to incident intensity based on uh, base 10. So this attenuation is based on a, on a product of molar extinction coefficient, chromophore concentration, and the optical path length. The physicists uh, do things on basis of, of natural log or exponential log base E. And so there's a, a conversion between molar extinction coefficient and mu A, which is essentially is uh, log base 10, or 10, the natural log of 10, which is about 2.3. Absorption spectra in tissue. Uh, this is absorption spectra of various tissue components over a large wavelength band, going from 100 nanometers to 20 uh, microns. Uh, you have water that's prominent at in the vacuum ultraviolet and in the infrared. You have protein and DNA in the UV, and then you have the characteristic spectrum of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. The key thing here is that below, above 600 nanometers or so, the absorption of blood and melanin drop off, and that allows light to penetrate deeply. Okay? And if you combine that with the scattering spectra, you find out that between this wavelength band of about 600 and about 11 or 1200, you have scattering that dominates absorption. It's not because scattering has increased, it's because the absorption has dropped. And this allows you to penetrate, for light to penetrate very deeply in tissue within this wavelength band of around 650 to 1100. And because scattering is dominant over absorption, this diffusion approximation, which we'll talk about on Wednesday, is valid. Outside of that, you really need to deal with more rigorous use more rigorous models of radio transport, BRT, and Monte Carlo. And with that, I'll end on the last slide, which is, uh, which uses, which motivates these uh, characteristic length scales that are defined by the reciprocal of the absorption and scattering coefficient to, um, to length scales of propagation. And I'll let you study this. I've gone on quite a bit. And uh, this, you're going to, um, you're going to explore these in your laboratory session this afternoon.